offending the girls therein in the little green Corvette. They began throwing objects at it. Then they began to gesture at each other, the universal sign of defiance. <laughs> and they're slowing down, slower and slower. Now he's in the right lane. He decides, maybe if I move over and he notices other cars are beginning to pack up behind these cars, he can't get out. He's boxing. He needs to be there at 8 o'clock. It's now 7.40. I can still make it. It's a five-minute mile, a five-minute drive downtown, only a few more miles to go. If I never get out on Bright, I can get around these youngsters. Well, they keep cavarting about until finally they offend each other enough that they start laughing riotously. The girl looks back, and when she does, she turns a little to the right, and he sees a little opening. So he zooms through. He just has to tap the gas, and that car lunges forward, grabbing pavement from under the tires. Now he's in front of them and he waves. Yes, I'm old, but I have a bad car. No matter how hard they try. So now he is screaming down Knickerbocker. He's about, oh, a little past where you would probably get off going to the stadium. And he hears a light. A piece of light and hears a siren. Oh, my goodness, it's a police officer on a motorcycle. So he pulls over to let the policeman go by. And the policeman pulls over behind him and says, Sir, do you know you were doing 87 miles an hour in a 40 mile zone? Well, officer, you see, there were some children behind, and I couldn't get out, and I was in a hurry, and you all do a wonderful job. Of, but she, you know, I, I, I'm really sorry about this. It's, it shouldn't happen. I deserve a ticket, but it's okay, because the police chief lives right down the street from me, and he'll take care of this. Well, here's the ticket, sir. 87 and 40. I'd like to see your driver's license and, and your proof of insurance. Picks out his proof of insurance. That's me. Uh, I own this $250,000 car. License, please. I changed suits today, and I guess my bill falls in the other suit. Well, I have to issue a license uh, restriction here that you're, you're driving without a license. So i got to write that up. Two minutes until night. Sorry, till I now the young people have caught up, now they're in front of him, they're waiting, they've been twittering each other. Let's get the guy in the little red car. They're all waiting. He pulls back into traffic and they form a four-lane phalanx in front of him, going down Bryant. And they wait until the light gets orange and then they go through and he has to stop each time. And he can't get away because they've got him boxed in. Finally, at about 9 o'clock, sorry, 8 o'clock, he rolls finally into the parking lot of the, of the bank. And unfortunately, somebody had parked in his place. He's got a nameplate, and that place is reserved just for him. So now he's having to go out and park on the street. Luckily, he finds a nice shady place across from the courthouse. So he parks there, grabs his briefcase, runs to the elevator, punches the seventh floor, the elevator trundles upward, and finally the doors open, and his boss is standing there, red faced with a vein sticking out on his throat, and he knows the boss is upset. He says, I'm sorry I'm late. And the boss says, Where the hell have you been? We've got this set up for an international video conference. You told me this would be ready today. You texted me and said it was ready to set it up where it goes. I set it up, and now we're late. It won't take but just a minute. Just a minute. So he puts a briefcase in, snaps the latches, opens it up. There's a beautiful picture his son's made. I love you, Daddy. Tree, sky, house, sister, mommy, daddy. And no laptop. Uh, boss, picture, I don't have a laptop. Boss, I can't believe you don't have a bat. I cannot believe you don't have it. I see your picture there of your son, Mac. He's retarded too, I see. <laughs> With that, the boss wheels and heads to his office. And then he turns again and says to the young man, you know you're a worthless piece of skin. You promised me something and don't deliver. And then you hide behind your retarded son's picture because you really didn't do it. You knew there was a deadline. And you suppressed it and said, I forgot. And then you made up a lie. You're worthless. Then he wheels his office and slams it up. The young man standing there, his world shattered. All of his co-workers looking at him. He said, I really had it. They all went to their offices, not want to be part of this. So he goes to his office and he thinks about it a few minutes and said, 
No, that wasn't right. My children are the smartest children in the world. They're not retarded. I really did this. I didn't slack off. This is a wonderful program. I'm going to go tell that boss. I'm going to set this up again. So he goes to the boss's office. The secretary says yes. And he goes in and said, I want to see the boss. She said, no. He told me to tell you when you came because he knew you'd come here with your tail between your knees. He said that he, he'd see you later in the day. But he decided he'd take off and go play some golf because you ruined his whole day. And he let everybody know it was your fault. And you didn't do what you said you were going to do. So the young man has no recourse. He goes back to his office and he's sitting there and says, You know, I can fix this. I'll set up an afternoon meeting. We'll do the video conference. I'll go home at lunch and I'll get the laptop and I'll make this work. So 11 o'clock rolls around and he decides, I I'm going to go home now. So he gets out, sees his car across the street. Goes and sits down in it absent mindedly, put his briefcase down beside him. He notices something warm and wet. So he swaps his hand behind himself, and up comes some gray, slick, slimy, drippy material. Uh, bird poop. And just as he looks up, a big splat hits him right on the forehead, running down his face. So he begins to wipe it off. When he's through, he looks like he's preparing for war. He's got this war dress on. <laughs> wipes it on his $1,000 suit. Uses his $500 tie to wipe his mouth. And he says, I'm going to be back with my son's pellet going after lunch. <laughs> Ignition starts in the car. He gets it in reverse. Gets into traffic. It's now a quarter after. Pulls down until he hits Beauregard. A steady stream of traffic is coming up Beauregard from Central High School. They're all turning right, apparently going there's not many, $250,000 red Maseratis that need our special attention as high school students. So they begin to text and call each other and say, get this is the guy, get in front of this guy. So three in the front, one on each side and one behind, fill this guy's entire field of view. Now he's boxed in. He looks and he recognizes the pickup, the little green car he saw this morning, and she's in front of him. Pickup's over here, and another car is over here. There's one on either side, and there's one behind, and he cannot get out. So he decides, I will wait my turn. I haven't had a very good morning. When the opportunity arises, I'm going to pass these little scoundrels. So he, very careful, watches, waits. And they get a little anxious, so he honks his horn. And the girl in the green car, not liking this old man honking at her, turns around and flips him off. When she turns, her wheel turns also. And she is about to collide with the car over here on the right, which dodges to the right. She sees that. She dodges to the left and nearly hits the pickup on the left where the boy has stuck his buttocks out. The young man in his car opens his briefcase, gets out an 8-inch letter opener, sees his opening. They now careen slightly apart, just enough for the little red car to get through. And as he goes by, he leaves his little mark on the behind of the young man, slicing open his buttocks. He leaps across the car, hits the driver. Two lanes of traffic crash over here. She goes this way. Three lanes of traffic crash over there. And he's got a free road, so he puts his car on cruise, stands up, and delivers the universal gesture of defiance to those folks. <laughs> Victory is his. Then he sees the policeman wheeling out. <laughs> he turns on the knicker box and he pulls over to the nearest parking lot. Police officer says, Sir, I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> I've never seen a grand man, a, a grown man, stand up in his car, flipping off innocent high school children who just had an accident. <laughs> Give me all the tickets, I don't care. <laughs> so the policeman commences to write the tickets. The young man finally gets back into traffic. Now he heads down the cul de sac to his Bentwood home. It hasn't been a very good morning. He drives down the road, and at the end of the highway, he sees that three-story mansion, and he sees the children's cars all over the curved driveway, and he's told them once, he's told them a thousand times, if you leave your cars on the driveway someday, I'm going to run into them. By God, today is the day. <laughs> so he puts it in low, and he gets ready, and he aims at the hot pink 
RBG first. Screaming and flying through the air saying, Mommy! Hits the front door, crashing into the glass. As it dies, the house alarm goes up. Next to that is a sip and spin. It is no contest. He hits it and it ricochets off the nearest tree and into the nearest window in the front of his house, breaking through the glass. The last to die, but the hardest to kill, was a tricycle, hardened by years of use by the five-year-old little boy. And the tricycle's about to die, and it knows it's going to die, so it fights back. His little pedals grabbing at the underside of the car as it goes by, wounding it madly. And then it reaches up with one of its little handles, and it scrapes a little layer of red paint all the way down to bare metal down the side of the car. And the car shudders and begins to wobble and die. A man jumps out, grabs that offending tricycle, beats it on the ground till he's sure it's dead, throws it against the garage, breaking the last window in the garage, and he is fuming now. He looks at his car, which is smoking and different colored liquids running out, and a scrape down the side. He is furious. He kicks open the one good door in the front door, and there he says, Love of his life, standing there with her hair in rollers, and a house good up. He says, Look at me. I've been at work all morning. I haven't had a good morning. And you don't even have the common courtesy to have dresses on, take care of those rats in the backyard you call your children. And look at you, you're fat! She says, I'm pregnant. He says, yeah, and it's probably not even in the morning. Then he walks right up to her in her face and says, I could have married anyone. I don't know why I chose you. She's taken aback. And she says, huh, I thought you loved me. And he says, illusion, lies. I couldn't love anybody as ugly as you. Then he slaps her. She staggers against the wall and falls. He goes to the kitchen, grabs the refrigerator door and opens it. And when he does, 12 eggs commit omelet upon the floor. He grabs a six pack of beer and only wants one beer, so he slings the other five, one of them hitting her and knocking her down. And the rest pirouette and spew their innards upon the walls, feet ceiling, floor, and counter. She surveys her world as he storms up the stairs, cussing every step of the way, and slams the door to his eyes. She staggers to the counter, her face the red welt. She looks in the backyard. The children are playing. The little boy has the water hose on. She goes to the door and slides it open and says, Timothy, are you playing in the water? The boys have a certain antenna. Deny everything to bad proof. No money. What water? It's only five. He thinks if he can't see it, it's not there. What water? Come here, Tim. Call me by middle name. Do you have the water hose? No, Mommy. Come here. So he walks slowly over to her, dragging the evidence with him, spraying from behind his back. She says, Can you see what's behind you? The water hose, Mommy, sis. He was playing with it. I knew you wouldn't like it, so I took it away from her because she had mud in the sandbox and I didn't want her to get in trouble. <laughs> you. <laughs> All of his cards were being played one by one. Nothing was working. <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> she grabs the hose and beats him with the hose until he can no longer stand. Then she wraps the hose around his little neck and throws him over the nearest banister to the pool. And he hangs there. Water hose wrapped around his little throat. Full of blessed grayness covers him. And the pressure builds in the hose and it releases him from its grip and he falls to the ground. His little sister playing in the sandbox, her back to him. Sneaks over there too far. <laughs> little sister been watching the Discovery Channel. She knows when the predator has you in its grip, if you play dead, he will let you go. <laughs> so she's now playing dead. <laughs> thinking he's killed the little sister. The sister, when she awakens enough, goes and gets the water hose to wipe all of the sand and mud out of her mouth and nose and sticks it in the kitchen. Finds the family dog asleep on the porch. Leaping from the top step, she crushes all the ribs on the left side of the dog. And it runs around the yard going, ow, 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 ow,
sees the family cat with its tail languidly hanging over the edge of the doghouse. The dog, leaping with what's left of its ability, severs the last six inches of the cat's tail. The cat, now running up the nearest tree, blood spurting from the tail, clawing the bark away, finally reaches altitude where it sees a nest with a bird. Leaping for the bird, it draws feathers from it, blood from it, the bird, barely able to get over the front of the house, carrying its heavy load, must relieve itself. And so it does. Splat on the windshield of the little red car. <laughs> and that is displacing aggression. <laughs> When his boss said that to him, should have ended right there, right? There. Should have told the boss. Off. When he kicks over that front door, I had the perfect line for years. It would be, hey, in this house, we're for each other. About five years ago, one of you young men in my class said she's wearing a house coat. <laughs> Deny everything to man proof, and then last resort, mommy, catch me if you can. Little sisters never turn their backs on their little brothers. Dogs always watch where the children are. Have you ever noticed? Where's the kid? There. Oh, there's the kid. Oh, there's the kid. Watch the children. <laughs> Cats, when they sleep, tuck their tails under their nose because they know their dogs out there. And birds. Bless their hearts, they're neurotic. They have to poop on your car. <laughs> Thank you for coming in.